in the Human Resources and Organizational Behavior area at the Anderson School. And while most of my research deals with things around managerial issues, attributes of commitment, that type of thing, I also happen to do some research which looks at um, wealth um, and wealth accumulation and looks at some of the differences that may occur um, based upon race, primarily between um, African Americans and whites. Um, and this, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is some results of work that I've been doing with a colleague of mine um, at Arizona State, Ian Carter. Um, and this is the second um, major piece of research that we've done looking at wealth. The um, first piece looks at, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it, looks at um, where some of the facts predict wealth, but it uses NSHF data from just 1987. So it's just a cross-sectional analysis as opposed to this, which is really, you know, a short time period, but we can look at, you know, kind of stuff, um, wealth accumulation. And so in any case, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to pass out copies of my slides, primarily because some of the tables that I have are, you know, they got lots of numbers and what I know, and it's going to be a little bit easier than everyone trying to squint and look at them on the screen. You know, feel free if you have any questions along the way um, you know, to inject. And I also hopefully there'll be time at the end to answer questions. I actually don't know how long this is supposed to go, so you have to stop me from talking. So as long as you want. Uh, well, I'm sure people got a plan. This is a Friday. So a lot of people ask, you know, why well, study wealth inequality? Um, and I think that there's a number of reasons, but the primary reasons why uh, we decided to look at it is that um, wealth is Oftentimes, the indication of power within our society. People who tend to have wealth have power in a lot of different ways. They have obviously economic power, they have access to political power. Wealth indicates within our society social prestige. Um, and those people who have wealth are able, their wealth itself produces more wealth and produces more income. And so it's a, a different perspective on looking at issues of inequality. A lot of the research was focused on inequality with, in sociology and whatnot. We'll oftentimes look at inequality based upon income, and that's very important. But even as we see the narrowing, although solely, of the income gap um, between blacks and whites, one of the things that you'll see is that the um, wealth gap um, has not been narrowing significantly within the United States. And so it's another piece of the inequality puzzle that we need to pay attention to. Um, so. Why study wealth accumulation? Um, one of the reasons why this, with this study we pay particular um, attention to the factors which help predict wealth accumulation is that one of the biggest predictors about whether or not you are actually wealthy is whether or not your parents are wealthy. I mean, this has been documented by Oliver Shapiro and others. Um, and one of the things that's of particular interest for African Americans in the United States is that for many of us, we weren't able to accumulate wealth. Um, because of the fact that under slavery or under Jim Crow segregation, we didn't have access to wealth. And so now the question becomes, since it's likely that our parents and our grandparents don't have wealth to hand down to us, the question then becomes, how can we, the people who didn't start with wealth, how can we accumulate wealth in our generation so we can then be able to pass that on? <clears throat> um, and so what it basically means is the only realistic way if we're ever going to close the wealth gap between blacks and whites is we have to accumulate it in real time. Just to give you just a little bit of background, um, what we see is that um, I mean, there's been a significant amount of research that's been done on wealth. You know, some of it, you know, um, very good and some of it, you know. But in any case, you know, basically what we know is that wealth is possibly correlated with a lot of factors including age, you know, the older we get, we tend to, um, in middle, in young, especially in middle age, to accumulate a lot of wealth. That's when we're buying houses, that's when we're investing in stocks and bonds, we're building up our savings and that type of thing. And then, um, although in later years, we tend to um, decumulate wealth. Basically, we spend down the money that we save in retirement, that type of thing. Um, we've also found that race, um, that race is, um, if, i.e. if you're white, is positively correlated with wealth. Education, more educated people um, tend to have higher levels of wealth. Um, if you tend to be more healthy, you tend to have higher levels of wealth. Then there's other things that higher income is correlated with wealth, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, the distribution of wealth within a 
the U.S. society is predicted by a number of things, and these just highlight just a few of them, but certainly government policy is one. Um, the United States right now, at least for, uh, for some period of time into the future, we have significant wealth um, uh, taxes on inheritance, for example. Um, the, the death taxes is oftentimes referred to, and that um, has some impact on people's ability to accumulate wealth, although there's significant ways in which people get around it, and right now, at least in theory, we are going to eliminate the wealth tax in approximately 2000, the debt tax in approximately 2010, although it comes back in 2011 because of some quirks in how Congress actually passed it. There's um, institutional factors. I mean, I talked a little bit about some of the historical factors, such as, you know, institutions of Jim Crow laws, um, slavery and whatnot. And there's also kind of modern factors or you know, um, you know, things such as redlining and whatnot, which has some impact. And then, pri and then finally, you know, private sector kinds of factors, which is, um, you know, kind of the fact that, you know, blacks are in less. Um, Larry Bobo has done some interesting work which, which talks about the fact that, you know, if you're black in the United States, more or less you end up paying a black tax on everything that we do. We end up paying more for our cars, we pay more for our houses, we pay more for our insurance to get less, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are ways, because um, the cost of living um, is in some sense is higher when you control for other um, demographic factors, um, it makes it hard for blacks to accumulate wealth. Um, also, wealth accumulation is affected by how you allocate the wealth that you have. There are some assets which actually um, earn more money than other assets. So if you invest your money in the stock market over a long, long, long period of time, historically, and admittedly these last couple of years are an exception, your, your rate of return that you would expect is much higher than if you invest in a savings account or if you invest in real estate, unless you're in California, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Start out with you know the essential um, thing of you know trying to figure out what are the factors which um, affect wealth accumulation, and um, there's a number of different ways and different data sets which people have used to try to address this um, issue, and we've chosen to use the National Survey of Household and Families. I mean we decided to use that because it's um, a um, longitudinal study which follows the progression of families at um, certain periods of time which are not necessarily quite regular. So they, they did a study in 1987, they did a follow-up with the families in 1992, they're right now in the process of collecting some additional data, and a lot of it depends upon funding. So, um, it, um, but what it does is it provides us with a glimpse at what um, families are doing at a particular point in time. One of the things that's particularly useful for this um, set of data is that it oversamples um, people of color. So we have a large number of blacks, um, Hispanics in particular, uh, which if you really want to understand what's going on within the black community, you need to do that. One of the faults with, um, one of the weaknesses with studies such as the Pound Study on Income Dynamics, which is another study which is oftentimes used, is that the number of blacks in that sample are um, very, very small. And so, you know, trying to, to draw, you know, Conclusions from that data concerning um, African Americans is, is difficult. Um, also, what this data set does is it provides us with um, detailed descriptions of what are the components of assets, um, of wealth that people have, both on the asset side and on the debt side. And so we have some in depth understanding of the different components um, of assets which um, people hold and the types of debts. This gives you a sense for some of the questions which get raised. Um, and type of assets that are measured. Um, you all, of course, have this in your handout. And um, as I said, you know, the net worth of your home, real estate, your business or farm, your car, you know, whether you've got money in your savings account, um, whether you've got investments in the stock market. Um, it also looks at various types of debt, whether you know you have credit card debt, whether you owe friends debt, whether you have educational loans, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what you see is it provides a rich source of, of data, which I think is really useful for um, addressing the questions which we have here. Um, 
the next slide gives you just a little bit of a sense, kind of, um, where or, or, um, some of the, the major differences that we might see in looking at the, um, the data. And this is just, you know, kind of um, figures of uh, medium income, um, assets, debts, and whatnot. And it doesn't tell us anything that's too surprising. For example, in either 1987 or 1992, um, white folks, uh, white families made more money than black families. And as far as median income, which is not surprising. Um, and that holds true in um, 1992 as well. And um, the gap actually widens um, to some extent. We see also that the amount of assets, um, white assets and black assets, are significantly different. One of the interesting things about it, from that period, from uh, 1987 to 1992, median assets um, for um, blacks actually went down, while at the same time they went up for, uh, for whites. And one of the things to remember about this period of time is the United States was in a recession. And you know, oftentimes people talk about when the United States gets, when we have a recession in the country, when um, the general population gets a cold, we get the flu. And this is just one of the ways in which it plays out. You know, are these net, net assets? Huh? These are net assets, right? Um, yes, these are net assets, right? Um, what, um, but these are total assets because uh, what we got net assets and, and debt, and oh, net assets is actually going to be the wealth figure. Oh, I see. And um, so what we see, and, and again, you know, because these are medium figures, um, there there may actually be a little bit of inconsistency because of you know when your SBS has run through regression. And then finally, what we'll see is that income differences. Um, one of the things we looked at is where you made more money starting in 1987 versus 1992. And what we find is that um, everyone income went up slightly. Um, however, um, white income went up more. One of the things I should say, just for the record, all these numbers uh, um, have been converted to 1987 figures. Um, so we're comparing apples to apples. And so we take out the inflation. Can I ask, um, yes. Uh, how do you have a positive wealth and no zero assets? Um, <clears throat> well, because one, well, one of the things in how do we end up calculating um, assets and debt and wealth is with with the wealth calculation, we end up with some, um, a lot of people end up with some missing data just because of, um, and so what happens is it, the, if you look at the end, the ends for those numbers will be different. Okay. Um, and so um, that, that's, if I remember correctly, what you can say. So, <laughs> question. <laughs> So for the last figure, the 66,000, right. how, how do you account for the disparity, that greater disparity? Uh, specifically, are you going to talk about how you account for that great disparity? Well, why, 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 why whites have so much more wealth than blacks? Is, aside from the pattern, is, is there something specific? Um, well, there, there's actually okay. a number. I mean, there's actually a number of factors um, which would help to explain why it is that, that um, the wealth levels are different. And this day doesn't actually speak to it directly. I mean, we, we'll be able to get to it indirectly because of the nature of the regression. Um, there's actually the, the earlier work that we did and the work by Oliver and Shapiro actually highlight where some of the factors which are highly correlated with um, differences in with the significant differences in wealth. Of course, the biggest predictor still is the fact of inheritance, which is all you know, kind of. Okay, so that's factored into the huh? that's factored into the sixty-six thousand. Right, because what because basically what this says is that you know um, what's the amount of wealth that um, individuals had um, at time one or time two, and at time one part of that's predicted by the fact why I inherited some certain amount of wealth over from my parents. And then we have this five-year lag, so in addition to wherever. Um, wealth you might have been able to add because of the fact you were earning more money and whatnot. If you started out with wealth, that, that wealth is that money is also making money. Right. And so, you know, it gives you kind of a multiplier time effect. And it's not really a multiplier time effect, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay um, now then, just to get you kind of um, a sense for you know, some of the, the, the population demographics for um, for example, the differences based upon race. What you see is, you know, um, the um, sample is predominantly female. Um, there's a significant difference between blacks and whites as far as rate of marriage, 
blacks are more likely to live in the South than the whites. Um, blacks are more likely to live in urban areas versus um, non-urban areas. Reading that right, um, etc. I mean, nothing that's not too surprising for people who you know, follow this kind of stuff. And so you know, the data set is probably a reasonable reflection of the population as a whole, which we would expect. <laughs> Um, what this slide does, if I can get it up here, and admittedly it's a very busy slide, but um, you all have it. Um, what it does is it looks at um, wealth by um, race, um, year, and by particular category. So um, if we were looking at this table, for example, we would see that. Um, Married families, um, in general, have, I mean, if we remember back to the table before, what we'll find is that married households, in general, whether you're black or white, at either time period, have more wealth than um, the average family. And then what we see is that even if you are married, um, if you're white, you're more likely to have um, more wealth than um, if you're um, in a single family head of the household. Which again, is not surprising. If you are in an urban area, you're more likely to have more wealth than if you're in a suburban area. No that? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what it says. If you live outside the South, you're more likely to have um, wealth than if you live inside the South. So again, nothing surprising. But what it does is it tells us that you know there's lots of relationships and that there's a complex relationship between um, wealth and how much wealth individuals hold and these other demographic factors and implies that we probably need some more type of sophisticated type of analysis in order to really try to piece this together. And so you know we get the standard you know, regression. Um, what we do is we take the um, as our dependent variable the natural logarithm um, of wealth at um, time two, which is in 1992, and we use the natural log of wealth as opposed to um, raw score of wealth just because um, wealth is a variable which is you know, very skewed. So by taking natural law, we compress that. Um, as independent variables, we use the independent variables which have been used in lots of previous research. You know, age, age squared, you know, father's occupation, higher education, whether or not you're in the South, whether or not you're married, we use income. One of the things, because we're looking at wealth accumulation, we want to see whether or not you actually increased your income over that period of time. If you got a raise during that period of time, that might make it a little bit easier for you to accumulate wealth. So we um, include um, a variable for um, increasing income, number of kids, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes? Do we have statistics on um, black and white couples, like, you know, mixed couples? Um, we actually don't have that um, statistic here. And one of the, and my guess, though, is that because that number is so small, relatively speaking, in the population, that we probably wouldn't have enough. Um, um, I mean, if we had that information, we probably wouldn't have enough data to be able to actually run this type of progression on it. So when you define a uh, black household, you it's, it's see really the based householder is black. It, yeah, it's really based upon the, um, the um, race of the respondent, which is normally the head of the household. So some of those so could, someone be. could be excused that what so the head of the household not being black. Um yeah. Or white. Okay. Right. I mean yeah, some of them could. I mean the odds are um, yeah, that most of them were the, not the huge, 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 huge majority of them right. um, that the um, that it's gonna be the same race. No, she asked about black and white and you said that it might not be as much information on that. Is it or you mean it by as far as just black and white, you know, interracial couples or interracial couples? Well, I'm just saying within this data set, there's not um, a question in the data set which asks, um, what is the race of your spouse? So that we can go back and then right. figure out. And um, further, since but, but we also know just, so small we also know within black and whites, it. right, exactly, the interracial marriage rate is tremendously, is ridiculously small with, for blacks and whites, but that number would probably not be enough that even if we did have that information, that we'd be able to um, have out. enough people to you know, break it out long now. That is a good question. Um, because anecdotally, you might think that those numbers would be different. But you suspect, given you know, the way you set up the work that is the race of the household that may 
right, to because try some of these differences. Anyway. Right. Well, I'm, well, well what we're, the underlying assumption is that the, the race of everyone in the household is um, the same as the race of the person who happens to be responding, who in the huge majority of cases is the head of the household. Okay. So. On the days when I pretend like I know something about sociology, you know, I write regressions. Um, there are days when I pretend like I'm a psychologist and I run ANOVA. And so today I'm pretending like I'm a sociologist. And so the idea was, um, this is um, the regression results. And let me actually speak just a little bit about how we actually ran this regression. Because this is just kind of um, the final table. We actually, the way we ran this regression is we entered variables in three steps. Um, and we did that for a couple of reasons. For those of you who may have read um, Dalton Conley's work on, let's see, being black, living in the red, in which he talks about you know, these issues of wealth, one of the things that he does um, is he says, well, look, you know, um, the race effect, um, he actually will argue, it, it ends up being not significant. And what he does is, you know, he starts off with regression, which predicts wealth. And then he says, OK, we put race in as significant, then you add in all these other kinds of background factors that the effect of race drops. So we said, OK, that's, that's a, a good hypothesis. We can do something that was similar to that, just so we can look at that. And the reason why we thought that was important is because of the fact that, um, one, we intuitively weren't quite sure that race completely should be washed out. But two, we were particularly concerned because, as Dan said, PSID, when you get through doing everything, if you actually look real close at the tables, what you find is that he ends up with running a regression with 60 some odd black people, plenty of white people, but 60 some odd black folks, and a regression with 20 equations, right. uh, 20 um, independent variables. And so, you know, that's probably not going to give us the most reliable data. So we said, well, our data set provides us with a way in which we could look at that. So what we did was we created a model where what we first did was we entered race by itself. And race has significant negative impact, i.e., if you're black, you're going to have less wealth. Um, I got those figures here, being was particularly um, interested. We then, um, in the second step of the equation, we entered um, wealth at time one, because we know that at the, um, that, you know, kind of this idea that the wealth that you start with has some impact on what you have going forward. We can't actually get to kind of what wealth people inherited because that question isn't asked, uh, and getting that kind of information tends to be particularly difficult to begin with, but at least it gets us a starting point because we're really trying to see how much wealth people accumulated over that five year period in any case. And so we enter that um, variable and then that does take away some of the race effect, but the race effect is still significant. And then finally we enter in all the other traditional kind of um, variables that we look at. And um, which, I mean, as you see, you know, the, the race variable still is negative, still is significant for predicting um, wealth at time too. So if we want to look at it and think about this for a second and what are some of the points that I would highlight, what it tells us is that, well, if we want to understand how much wealth people have in time two, in this case 1992, um, in general, I mean, we've got a, a, a very good model. We have an R squared of 0.5, um, so, you know, acceptable for this type of work. Um, clearly, um, how much wealth you start with is, is a good predictor. But then all the factors that we're used to seeing as being predictors of wealth in general are predictors of wealth um, that you accumulate. So um, that seems relatively reasonable to us. But we say, OK, well, this is all fine and good. But does this, but, but does, because race is significant, it implies that maybe the world works a little bit differently for black folks than for white folks. And of course, we could run this with you know, a whole bunch of interaction terms, but for us, we said it was just easier just to run two separate models looking at um, blacks and white respondents and seeing um, what um, we might be able to find out. I mean, and again, this is similar to some of the work that um, Oliver and Shapiro did. One of the things that's very interesting about this is while the model holds up very well, the factors which have uh, helped to predict how much wealth whites are going to have at time two is affected by all the things. That we think you know if you're more educated, if you live in an urban area, if you got a raise, um, the older you are, um, et cetera, et cetera, all those things matter. Um, now then, the flip side for black folks is that most of that stuff doesn't matter. What seems to matter for us is well, how much money are we making? Um, how much? Um, whether or not we got raised, so did we get more money? 
and then, of course, you know, the age thing, and the number of workers. The number of workers is related, I mean, because that probably helps, because it means you're making more money if you have more people in your household working. Uh, and it, but it's a slightly different effect from the total income effect. And so, we're like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I mean, this is kind of interesting. This actually was um, particularly caught our eye because in our previous um, research looking at just 1987 data, um, and again, that was a cross-sectional analysis. One of the things that um, we highlighted was that um, income alone wasn't going to be the, um, you know, because what we did was, you know, we ran these separate models, we made some predictions going into the future, and what we found that is that even if you close the, what we predict is even if you close the income gap, it wouldn't close the wealth gap. Um, and while that's true, what it does, what this model seems to indicate is, yeah, but doing stuff with income is probably the best that we can do right now, um, which you know, and I also find well, interesting. Well, given the disparity, that's the way. Well, right, but then one of the things that's interesting is that it's, it doesn't say that people need to go out and get you know more education. It's not saying that people need to go out and get married, having the quote nuclear family. It's not saying um, that. Um, people should have less children. It tells white folks they should have less children. It doesn't tell us. I mean, the, the number of children is, has uh, no significant impact for black folks. I mean, so some of the things that we look at, you know, from a public policy perspective around, hey, if black folks just lived right, you know, did the quote right things, um, that, that would, that's where the issue is. And, and they're making individual choices which are not in their best interest as far as closing the wealth inequality gap. This provides a little bit of information that says, well, maybe that's not the case. One, one public policy factor that <clears throat> does seem to enter in in terms of education is that currently there are just now programs in uh, high schools uh, to which students of color have access about fundamentals uh, such as banking, um, um, uh, investing in stock programs, and so forth. And so when we talk about the inheritance of wealth, um, inheritance of education regarding how to accumulate wealth is, is a factor and then is a hidden factor and then in terms of, of the disparity uh, from a public policy point of view, that seems to be one way to intervene if, it's, if the information is not provided by the family. Right, I mean, I mean, there certainly is one issue, which is oftentimes raised anecdotally, that, well, you know, even for the money that black folks have, the problem is they're not doing the right things with it. Right. Either we're, um, more, we're putting it into buying a, a big Lincoln Continental that's too expensive as opposed to putting it into a house or where. And so... Or not investing at all. Or, 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 or not investing at all, that type of thing. I mean, another thing, though, I mean, to be clear, is that for the huge number of black folks, it's not like they have a whole lot of wealth to begin with, or they're accumulating a whole lot of wealth to begin with. So we're talking about, you know, kind of a relatively um, small number that people are playing with. Um, and so we say, okay, wow, this is kind of interesting. Um, and then also, you know, to, to get to the, that, the, the point that we are just talking a little bit about, there's always this question of, well, you know, if blacks just kind of did the right thing with the assets that they had, you know, that would also help. that you all actually have it in front of you, I guess that's close enough for government work. Um, what we also did was we said, because of the nature of the data, we could actually break out what were the assets which had um, a better, a, a larger impact upon um, people's ability to accumulate wealth over this um, period of time. Because, you know, there is an argument that, you know, some assets help you accumulate wealth more than others. And, um, so again, you know, we kind of did, you know, it's a two-step model where we um, first aired the, um, the, different comp the different components of at the different assets that individuals have, you know, home net worth, your real estate net worth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, then we air in all the other, you know, useful kind of demographic factors. And what we find is that while for um, whites, investment and kind of all the things, you know, homes, real estate, farm, car, savings, investments in the stock markets, all are helpful in predicting 
whether or not people will have more wealth in 1992 than they did in 1987. For um, 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 blacks, um, the, the biggest predictors are you know the network in your home, real estate, and farm network. But then I thought it was particularly interesting as that you know at least anecdotally, if we were putting so much money into our cars, we would have thought that that would have had some impact one way or the other. It would have been either positive or more likely negative because cars don't hold their value. Um, they're sort of lousy investments. Um, but the thing that was also interesting is that you know savings and um, investment were big um, predictors. And again, you know, there's always this caveat of when you have people who are doing a very, very small amount of that, you know, that could be the issue. But, you know, I mean, we do have a wide range of, of people in the sample, and so there should be a reasonable number of, of respondents. You know, we have 616 um, black families in the full model. There should be a reasonable number of families, say, in the top 10%, who one would expect are doing some of these things. Or you know, having you know, some money in, in, in the stock market or whatever. Uh, and of course, you know, income and stuff like that matter. Uh, and so in any case, um, those are, 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 are um, I mean, that's kind of the day. I just wanted to make a couple of concluding remarks and that hopefully we can have um, some discussion on what some of this stuff um, actually means. The, this day I'm actually in the process, or Wink and I are actually in the process of revising it for um, the journal right now. So any useful and helpful comments you all have or questions would be greatly appreciated. Um, just a couple of, of um, points. And one of the things I think that this highlights, and again, I guess I should be mentioned, the, the, re -mentioned the, the caveats, this is over a short period. It's a five year period. And you know we really need to know over a much longer period of time you know, what are the factors which really help us to understand how it is the wealth accumulates. But this just gives us some initial idea of where the direction of some of the variables. But it lets us know that closing the wealth gap is probably going to be difficult, um, which we already knew, because we knew we are not going to inherit. it. Um, we, our earlier research also argued that. And then even if income, um, increasing income is the biggest predictor of whether or not the gap is going to be closed, we also know because of other research that, you know, the income gap is not closing at this huge rate. And one of the things that's interesting about it, if you look at actually our previous study, where we kind of modeled what would happen if we actually did close the income gap completely, it still wouldn't um, address the wealth issue. So, you know, there are some um, issues there. And one of the things that you see with both of these studies is that um, race still plays um, a significant role in and apart from all the other factors which we know are relevant, whether it be age, health, um, income, et cetera, et cetera. So there's still some other stuff there um, which seems to be explained by the fact that we are um, black in America, um, which hinders our ability to accumulate wealth going forward. Uh, so in any case, questions? Uh -huh. What is the understood definition of wealth? Um, well, um, it's basically net assets. You, you look at how much, what are the things that you have which are worth money, and you look at what are the things that you have, which, what are the debts you have, how much money you owe, um, and you take the difference between the two. So debt-asset ratio? Well, um, the debt-asset ratio is a, a, a fraction to ratio that looks at that right, exactly. I just had a comment, actually. Um, I have been thinking about this for a some work with the Urban League on home ownership, and I'm interested in your finding of marital status. In my work, uh, looking specifically at home ownership rather than wealth more broadly, I similarly find that marital status has a protective effect for, for whites, but not for blacks. Mm -hmm. um, but unlike you, and I really, I really like to distinguish between the impact of having more than a worker as opposed to marital status per se. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really quite interesting. Other questions? Gosh, I should have brought more slides. I figured it. <laughs> <laughs> but what is being predicted here? The change in wealth from? No, the wealth at time too. Okay, it's just the wealth at time too. Right. Okay. So what? Yeah. So what kind of advice would you? Um, a person, they have income, and how would they develop wealth? I mean, 
Well, it would take a couple generations, or is that what? Well, it, 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 it would line? probably take an, a, a, an infinite number of generations. <laughs> I mean, probably for a variety of reasons. But you know, one of the things is, I mean, if you look at kind of the research on wealth in general, what you see is that wealth is getting held in narrower and narrower. Um, you know, so um, it's become more concentrated. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, if I was talking to someone individually, I'd tell you the things I would tell anyone to do. Hey, if you want to live frugally, you want to invest in, you know. Um, Good investments, you know, um, home. Make, um, you certainly want to have a home, you know, because that is a decent investment. But then after that, you know, you don't necessarily want to put all of your assets into a home because there are other um, assets which actually normally will return more, like the stock market and whatnot. It has higher risk, but it has a higher return. Um, now then, with all that said, what this research tends to say is that's not going to be enough to close the wealth gap. But then. Um, I didn't really expect it was going to be enough to, to close yeah. the wealth gap. Yeah. Um, and, and, and actually, one of the things that's interesting, just from a public policy perspective, um, I talked a little bit about the fact that Congress got rid of the death tax, which is one of the ways that we tried to re redistribute a little bit of that wealth. And one of the things that really concerned me was that um, the Congressional Black Caucus listening to people like um, Parsons and listening to people like Robert Johnson um, or basically um, said the argument, well, look, we want to get rid of the death tax now because blacks are finally at the point where we're accumulating wealth, and so we don't want them to have to give up the wealth they've accumulated. And the thing that was interesting about that is, is um, because even under the old law, your first um, $625,000, $650,000 in um, assets were exempt. If you were married, it was twice that. Um, which meant they already covered 99.9% .9 of all the black folks in the country. So, you know, the Congre I mean, getting rid of the death tax does nothing for us. I mean, the death tax is really meant for this 1% of people who are all predominantly white, except for, I mean, we can name the Oprah's, <laughs> Oprah, Bill Cosby, Michael Jordan, and Tiger Woods, and a handful of other folks, Puffy. <laughs> you know, I mean, we can basically name them on a few hands, and yet they were voting and supporting public policy, which in the end is not in our best interest, because the only way to really kind of get wealth into other people's hands is to get it out of the hands of the people who have it. And the only way that that can happen is through some major social policy um, and some kind of taxation on wealth. I mean, I was actually watching um, C-SPAN yesterday, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, and there was a panel with um, um, Ruben, the former um, Secretary of the Treasury, and um, Kerry, um, was it Bob Kerry, whichever was the former senator from uh, Nebraska, and they were talking about a number of different economic issues. And one of the issues that they were speaking about was this issue of the death tax. And Ruben made this comment, which is he, he could not understand. Here's this guy who was wealthy beyond all of my imagination. Was making the point that he couldn't understand how in a country which says that look we are egalitarian and we figure that everyone should be rewarded based upon their own merits, how could we support a system which basically says that you know if you're born rich you get to stay rich, um, so it's really not based upon your merits, it's based upon the luck of birth. And but I mean that's the reality. And I guess the thing for me, which I guess is also kind of an irritant is that even if you know you don't get to inherit all the wealth of your parents, you still throughout your lifetime get a lot of the benefits beforehand. Because you know if your parents are rich, that means you get to go to um, Harvard or Stanford or UCLA or some of the elite institutions and you're going to be able to get access to better jobs and whatnot. So it pays back in a whole lot of different ways, even aside from the actual dollars that you um, um, collect because of the status that you inherit. Um, are you factoring in another social um, issue, David, this idea of communalism in the sense of other ethnic communities, uh, let's take Koreatown for example, in the last 10 years they've had a tremendous development of that um, geographic locale which I'm told is based on their systems of being able to join together in formal and informal uh, agencies, unions, associations, and so forth, pooling the resources, being able to invest in property and other businesses, and therefore spread. Um, well, my research doesn't touch on that. You know, there is that, I mean, that issue that oftentimes gets raised, which is, you know, there are some communities where the dollar goes around several times before it finally leaves the community. The black community is one of those communities. I mean, the 
the, our dollar comes in and it goes right back out. You know, it may not go back out in one time, but probably one and a half times. Kind of. It's a, the argument uh, that the West Indian community has is similar to the, you said the Korean community, uh -huh. and there was a debate about uh, whether that was actually true or not, so especially because it's centralized on the East Coast versus the West Coast. I haven't seen any research on that. Um, I have heard about anecdotally. I mean, one of the things, though, that may be an interesting question just to think about is I think a lot of that depends upon how insular the community is. Mm -hmm. And um, West Indian communities, at least from my experience, you know, as you get down second generation, third generation, tend to be, be less yes, insular yeah. because of issues around language and whatnot. It's easier right. to kind of. Um, because they immigrate um, through networks, and those networks. Well, right, but then what happens is they, they lose those ties more quickly, so it's hard to hold that um, mm -hmm. hold that, that, that kind of phenomenon in at, at, in the same way in, than if you were you know in a Korean community. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, I haven't seen your research on it. Um, going back to what you were saying about um, redistributing, like taking the wealth away from the wealthy and distributing it, how could that um, be like a sure method? Um, to decrease the wealth gap because it's not 100% certain that the people that are not wealthy are not going to get it back again. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's not 100% sure. I mean, one, I mean, redistrib redistributing wealth um, provides an opportunity for everyone who is not wealthy, black, white, or otherwise, to have a better chance of becoming wealthy. Because if you're poor white, you don't have a chance of becoming wealthy either. <laughs> um, just because of the fact you know most of the wealth is already held by other people. Um, you know, there's going to be a few people who are Bill Gates of the world, but he didn't start poor white. But um, uh, and, and so, but, and so, I'm just arguing that it increases the opportunity for people to be able to have access um, to, to greater um, wealth. Uh, and there's still going to be these other disparities, um, which are going to play in. The well, Oliver and Shapiro talked about um, a number of mechanisms that. Uh, Resulted in race sort of having a direct effect on the, the ability of people to accumulate wealth. I think a lot of the questions, or a couple of the questions that have been asked, are sort of, um, sort of implicit in the question is this whole issue of what is it about race that, that, that results in disparity, given the fact that we know that there is disparity. Right. Could you just kind of review some of the information on the debate that they talked about? Well, I, mean, I think they talked about a number of things. I mean, help me if I forget some of the major ones. Um, but one of the things is. Well, I mean, I talked a little bit, I don't know if you were here, about the fact that if you pay a black tax, you know, we end up paying more because of redlining, um, more for insurance, more for cars, more for, you know, pretty much everything, which means that it's hard for us as individuals. We have less, quote, discretionary income, right. which we then have the ability to reinvest. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, that, would, I think, would be probably one of the biggest things. And there's the, the home value issue, too. Right. Well, well right. right. I mean, that's, 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 that's actually part of the same piece, because the yeah. thing is, even if I have a home, which it, if I'm bald with hills, for example, which, you know, you would look and you would say, okay, it could be a beautiful home, has a great view and whatnot. Um, you go five miles to another hill, which is predominantly white, mm -hmm. and that house is worth a whole lot more. Yeah. And so, you know, again, there, there's, there's ways in which our country devalues um, the assets that we do hold and it charges us more to get those assets. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can also look at the same thing as far as our <laughs> What was that? You can't win. Right, no. Unless <laughs> you overturn it. Um, and that's why closing the income gap really doesn't mean that much. I mean, the, 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 the dominant group is so far out in terms of the race that you're, the gap is just getting bigger. You know, right. you're, you're closing some of the, right. I guess, the, the causes of the gap. The other ones aren't being right. The other, the other ones aren't being addressed. Right. All the uh, sort of the uh, the word under the bridge is still still there. Right. right now. And then we won't even have to we won't get into discussions about differentials in the education system. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the factors yeah. which are significant in the model sure. yeah. are, all have a, a racialized component to it, right. yeah. <laughs> and it all is negative as far as we're concerned. Are you continuing in, in another five year uh, with your study or? We, what we'll do next is once um, NSHF has their next wave, which they're in the field collecting now, and so you know, it'll take them a, a few months in order to you know get the um, you know all, all data cleaned up and whatnot. We'll come back and we'll revisit this analysis. Okay.
on it and say, okay, well now we have a period that goes from 1987 to 2001. Let's see if the findings that we have now actually do hold up because then that becomes a, a very significant period. You can go get kind of a boom and bust included from the economic perspective and then, so it should really be helpful. Oh, one thing I should know, which I meant to mention at the outset, um, a lot of this research was actually funded by CAS and the IAC, so I have to yeah. thank you all for that. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be possible otherwise. So. Well, I want to ask one question. Business ownership, does that have any play in uh, the wealth? Because some, a lot of African American businesses, you know, open and they didn't close and that kind of thing. Was that because you have this whole thing of black enterprise promoting business and entrepreneurship in the African American community, but the gap is still not well, I mean, closing? I mean, was that yeah? Um, with people own businesses, did that make a difference? Yeah, I mean, business ownership is one of those things um, that helps. And um, well, actually, the, the variable that says real estate network, I probably should relabel it, is actually okay. real estate business. Okay. And, um, no, actually, no, I have to kick that back. It's a farm that's where business is. It's a farm that's where business is. It's a farm that's up in one factor. But anyway, that is significant. It's a mm -hmm. significant variable, so it does have a positive impact. Of course, I think the point to make, though, is that black businesses, like all new businesses, the huge majority of them fail. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, that is a way to accumulate wealth if you're lucky. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're good and all the rest, but... Um, the old boys network still is more reliable. Well, it's not even the Old Boys Network. If you're a, a, a white man connected to the Old Boys Network. That's what I'm saying. I mean, look at George you W. Bush had, business. Had, had the best Old Boys Network around, and all of his business endeavors, with the exception of um, the Rangers, which he just got really lucky on, were flops. Mm -hmm. And he had every connection you could have. Okay. And so, you know, it, it's not just about connections. It's just that, you know, starting a business is just inherently hard. Now, admittedly, he didn't have some of the things which, some of the difficulties which would make it hard, which is he had, he had access to capital and those types of things. But even if you have access to capital, um, and we see this with the dot coms, oh, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of those companies have tremendous access to capital and they still fail. Yes. And they burn through, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> um, just because, you know, it's hard to come up with a good idea yeah. that That's, people want to yeah. buy into and you got to get the word out to people, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a